book of Ephesians, if you'll turn with me to the fourth chapter, Ephesians chapter number four. I pray that you'll be encouraged and blessed today, that the word of God will strengthen your heart and mine as well, and that we'll be able to give God the glory throughout this day and in the days to come. I have so many opportunities to bear witness anymore as I go out working sometimes or just being out where we have to be, you know, to make the purchases you have to make. You have to make a grocery store run. You have to do the, you have to go get gas. You have to do those things that you do, which kind of hurts your feelings, which I noticed it's a little cheaper out here at the corner this morning. I said, I just shut on in there and got me a tank full. <laughs> and so you, you know, your radar is on. You're looking around for prices and everything else. You know, you got the radar on doing your best to try to help yourself, but uh, it is a peculiar time. But we're looking to God and His Word, and we believe we're going to be marvelously encouraged by the Holy Spirit. You'll notice verse 17, uh, the Bible says, uh, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have been uh, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And we'll pause right there for a few moments and just begin to expound on some of this if we can and try to unpack some of these truths to help us in our daily lives. One thing we can point out, of course, is that the Apostle Paul never left any half-taught disciples. Paul had a, such a desire to see people grow in the Lord that he would go to great lengths to make sure that either he got to, back to people again once they were born again, he'd either go back and make another visit or he would send somebody that was qualified to teach them the Word of God. So Paul did not leave any half-taught disciples as we search the Scriptures. Sometimes we get the idea because he traveled a good bit, we kind of get the idea that people got born again, got baptized, and Paul left them, and there was very little that happened after that. Of course, he wrote these letters to them as well. His compassion and love for the church compelled him to write these epistles uh, that had been canonized and established in the Scripture as the Word of God, of course, and so we are remarkably blessed by everything that we have uh, that it was written by the Apostle Paul and, of course, all the others of the New Testament and the Old. But you'll notice in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, if you look at that verse, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. He wrote this letter to the believers that were in Ephesus. When it says he wrote to the saints, we know that he wasn't writing to dead people. I mean, the modern idea of a saint is somebody that has died and then somebody uh, conferred sainthood upon them. Isn't that right? <laughs> but he was writing to people who had been dead in trespasses and sins, but now were alive unto God and separated unto God's service. Isn't that true? Their lives have become sanctified by the blood of Jesus and the word of God, and now they're laboring in the ministry and bearing witness for Christ. And so the letters written to them, Paul the Apostle to the saints, which are at Ephesus. If you're a born-again believer this morning, I know you feel like I do because we all feel flawed and feel like there's areas where we could grow and come along. But I know God refers to you as a saint this morning if you've allowed your life to be separated by God from this world. Isn't that true? And he goes on to say, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. This is who he's addressing the letter to. How I many know, brethren, you get so much more out of God's word when you begin to be faithful to what you do know already? Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. One reason some folks are stumbling and not able to receive some of the things of God is because they first must become faithful uh, to what they already know to be true. I mean, a lot of folks, if they just do the general will of God, if they would just do the basics, if they would just carry out some of the Christian disciplines of getting into God's house and being a part of what the Lord is doing in the local community, I mean, oh, brother, that would be an immense blessing to them otherwise in their spiritual life. I know you're going to shut me down in this camp meeting service. I can tell 
<laughs> but I'm in a brethren. There's a real truth in it. When people don't already do what they already know what to do, mm -hmm. I'm in a brethren. The light will shine even further down the road, and they will right. gain even more understanding and appreciation for other things in the Bible. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Thank God you're here today. We rejoice with you that you're able to be here. We know that not everybody's physically able to be here, and some can't be regularly because of all the things that they're going through. We, we understand that. But I want you to know, brethren, there is a marvelous blessing in being separated from the world and being faithful to God. Amen. And the scripture teaches us that the faithful child of God uh, will actually, I love God's word so much so they will fall in love with the scriptures and to the point that every word in the Bible becomes a commandment to them. I mean, you know, some folks are looking through the Bible and trying to see what the commandments are and they think, you know, well, um, I found certain commandments, but a lot of things in here may not necessarily be a commandment. But how I many you know when you get in, uh, where you fall in love with Jesus, every word in the Bible becomes a commandment to you? Yes. Hello? <laughs> Glory to God. It's not just a good suggestion anyway. Isn't that right? The Bible is not just filled with a bunch of suggestions. <laughs> Isn't that right? It's teaching for victorious life and help us to overcome. The Bible says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Which means, of course, that his commandments are not a burden to us. They're a blessing. Isn't that right? How many of God's commandments is our way to, to life? It's our way to joy and blessing. When we keep the commandments of the Lord, we are never sorry for keeping God's word. Can you say amen? amen? I've had some regrets. I've been sorry about a few things, but it's never had anything to do with keeping his commandments. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, my regrets and my uh, troubles and the burdens I've had most of the time have been things that I have brought upon myself. Are you out there? <laughs> but his commandments are not grievous. And Paul the Apostle writes them and insists to them. You notice he says in verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord. He's using some mighty strong language to insist that they would live a life different from the Gentiles. Sometimes we use the word Gentiles uh, in an ethnic sense. And in some ways that's what Paul the Apostle is doing here. Gentiles and Jews were the only two groups of people. According to the Jewish people, either you was a Jew or you were a Gentile. They meant, <laughs> and of course, Gentile meant that you were without God. But these were Gentiles now who have God. If the people of Ephesus, they weren't Jewish mostly. There was a Jewish contingency there as it was in practically every ancient city there would be some Jewish people and possibly a synagogue there. But by this time, they tell us that Paul the Apostle's church that he pioneered in Ephesus had 18,000 members. They're meeting in houses. They're meeting in various places. He had uh, taught for a long time in a hall that he rented from Tyrrhenius, the Bible says, the book of Acts. And he taught in that hall that while they were not using it for other classes during the day, he'd go in there in the middle of the day when a lot of other folks would kind of have their siesta. He would go in there and teach the Word of God and, of course, that would encourage Christians and other ministers and churches were being born in other towns round about Ephesus, much like Colossae. That was another one of those church plants that came out of what Paul was doing at Ephesus. His converts went out and made converts. Well, in writing them this letter, of course, he says to them in the midst after giving them this tremendous teaching about God's blessings, Remember Ephesians 1, 3, God hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All right. Can we stop and have a little 21-day camp meeting? I mean, if you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings, can you say amen? In Christ Jesus, did you know in Christ Jesus, that phrase is in the book of Ephesians 27 times. Wow. Having no being in Christ Jesus is a whole lot better than being out of Christ Jesus. Oh, amen. amen. And so he said now that you're in Christ Jesus, I want you to walk like you're in Christ Jesus, that you should not be walking like those who don't know God and don't have God in their life. Amen. And that's my message today on this Father's Day Sunday. It's good for fathers. It's good for mothers. It's good for children. Can you say amen? Yes. It's good for people of all backgrounds and everybody, brethren, that you and I are to live a life of contrast. Uh, that's really my message today, the call to the life of contrast. In other words, your life should not resemble uh, this world system and this world around us. Right. Yeah. The word world, of course, is used several different ways in the New Testament. Sometimes the world has to do with the Father's creation. Sometimes it has to do with the people in the world. But sometimes the world means this world system, this godless world system where people are so ready uh, to uh, look at anything 
else other than God, where they're embracing things and embracing their own ideas of God and are so ready to worship the creature rather than the creator. Yeah. That's that godless world system that we're thinking of when he's talking about them not walking according to the Gentiles, it's not walking according to the things of this world. The Bible says if you love the world, then you, the love of the Father is not in you. But then the Bible says God so loved the world. What does he mean? He loves the people that are in the world. That he gave his only begotten son. I mean, oh, this world system is anti-God. It stands in rebellion against God. And so writing this uh, church of Ephesus where there is a huge pagan temple. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They went to great lengths to build a, uh, you know, a temple to the goddess Diana. And it had an incredible amount of activity going on with it. Of course, it had been a pretty much a coastal city. People were coming in there from all over the world through their shipping. And they would experience the worship of Diana. Of course, they would buy the little artifacts, the things they made to look like Diana. And of course, Paul's ministry was a great emphasis, along with other Christians, uh, that it reduced the, the uh, souvenir trade of the little goddess, goddesses of Diana, those little things that were made of her. You know, that's why the, the coppersmith union got mad at him and wanted to hurt him and all that. <laughs> and so there's a lot of history to Ephesus in our New Testament. But what we know to be true is, is that Paul called them to live a different life than the people around them. And I'm here to tell you in many ways that flies in the face of what we're being taught in the church today a lot of times. And they're telling us now that, you know, for the most part that the Christian church is just here so that we can have a little self-help seminar so that uh, we can be our best self. But I'm here to tell you we're here to call people to repentance. We're calling people to abandon their own life. If you used to go down to the temple to Diana, how I many know we're encouraging not to go down to that temple anymore? How <laughs> I many know if you used to worship those things and worship paganism and be a part of all of that? How I many know after you get born again, there ought to be a radical change that can be seen in the daily lives of those who claim Christ? Can you see that? Yeah. We're to live a life of contrast. And of course, there are many other passages. Paul had similar things to say to other churches. And we're going to take a few minutes and think about some of them because going forward, how could we possibly win others or witness to this generation unless we're going to live a life of tremendous contrast? If you want to live a life of conformity and just conform with what's going on and everything else, I mean, no, brethren, you'll just be swept along with the crowd. Right. Your testimony will mean nothing. You can claim to be Christian, and uh, that won't mean anything because I think, well, they're that kind of Christian. Uh, that just kind of goes along with everything. They think that, you know, if you love like Jesus loved, then that means that you just go along with everything under the sun. But I'm here to tell you, they canceled Jesus out for a reason. I mean, no, they didn't just start canceling people out after they got Facebook on the Internet. Can you see that? They canceled him out because he called them to a different life. He called them to abandon their old life. He called them to abandon their religious uh, hierarchy that they had established, the religious system they had, he called them to abandon that. I mean, brother, it's never been popular for people to call on people to repent. Hello? Some people point out, you know, that some of the professional ball players that some of them kneel and things like that. Some of them even pray or whatever, but none of them have had to carry the kind of persecution that uh, uh, Tim Tebow had to go through with. They said, what was the difference? I read a a book recently and where they talked about what was the difference? Why did Tim Tebow go through so much trouble? They really just drummed him out of the NFL and they, they did all kinds of things to come against him every way that they could come against him. And the difference was that he called people to repentance. He told them, you're going to have to have a change in your life. I tell you what, we're never going to be hailed in the community as somebody great as long as we're telling people that they have a need so great that they need a savior uh, they had to die on the cross for them. I mean, no, people just don't appreciate that message. They want to believe they're all right like they are. Right, I'm here to tell you, God loves you like you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. Right. Can you help me preach a little bit this morning? I love those who are watching my Facebook, but if you're not ready to make heaven your home, it's time to get ready. This thing is winding up. The prophecies are being fulfilled. The time is passing. The wheels are turning. Jesus is coming, and this thing's going to be over with. Can you say amen? Right. This may be our last Father's Day down here on the earth. It'd be all right with me. I'm saying, even so, come quickly. Uh, but if you can't say, even so, come, Lord Jesus, I mean, no, you ought to say, uh, first of all, come into my heart, and then come after me. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. 
There's a lot of folks, and they do some praying in America. There needs to be a revival in the United States. There ought to be a joy and a blessing in the lives of believers that cannot be seen out there in the world. That's right. If we've got Christians in the church and every one of them look like they've been baptized in pickle juice, uh, I mean, no, there's something wrong when Christians don't have a bit of joy, no desire to reach out to anybody, uh, no desire to reach out to the world or be a witness to anybody else, no desire to try to move up or change or grow or do anything else. I mean, brethren, that's a sign of spiritual deadness. If we're going to have a revival, let's have it. Let's just let it start here. Can you say amen? Let's don't wait till somebody else comes from another town over here. I mean, we're already here. Jesus is already here. And God is on the throne. And the power of revival is the power of repentance. Can you say amen? Yes. Uh, you know you're having revival when people start abandoning their old life. Yes. I tell you, I had some folks saved years ago when they did. They took their Ouija board and their other stuff like that and come out there and pile it up at the end of the driveway and set it on fire and burn all of that. They were living together without the benefit of marriage, and, they, and a few days later, they wanted to get married. Can you say amen? And they went to their separate rooms, and didn't, <laughs> they didn't come back together no more until after it was over with, and God did a mighty miracle in them. I performed the wedding, and they, when they came back together, they said it is as if they had never been together before, that God did such a, a work of purity in their lives during that period of time. God give us some real revival. Can you say amen? Right, yes. We ought not be living the feudal lives that we were living That's before right. we got born again. Paul the Apostle said, the life you had before was just feudal. It's empty. You remember the passage we read? The Bible says, you ought not walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. In other words, in the emptiness. Mm -hmm. Our society today, brethren, is empty. It's bankrupt. Help us, Jesus. I tell you, people are bankrupt whenever they will do anything that they can think of to just get themselves ahead so self-centered, so completely selfish that they really don't care how it bothers or troubles anybody else. I heard this week on the news uh, that a person uh, shot somebody because the person who bring in the order from Chick-fil-A left out one of the sh milkshakes, so when he got there with the order, the man who made the order shot him. Now, I know that the milkshakes at Chick-fil-A are pretty good. <laughs> Maybe better than average. Maybe better than everybody else's milkshake. But how I many know you all not be shooting people because uh, that you didn't get your milkshake or Life is still going to go on. What if you had to live like us diabetics? You can't ever have a milkshake. I ain't had a milkshake in so long. I don't know what one would be like. <laughs> well, here they're going to shoot people over it. And, of course, uh, it just goes on and on. We could give all kinds of uh, things, uh, uh, examples, you know, from... Uh, the newscast and all that sort of thing. But brethren, uh, the emptiness, the futility. That's what the word futility means. It sounds like a big word. You know what it means. It's just emptiness. The same word in the Old Testament, the same idea, is what uh, Solomon used so much in the book of Ecclesiastes, saying that life is empty. Life is futile. Couldn't find any meaning in life until he said, well, we need to remember the Creator in the days of our youth. I mean, without God, life doesn't mean anything. Life is not worth living unless you have the Lord in your life. That's right. And for all of those believers who claim to be born again, I mean, it's time to get on with living for God. Can you say amen? If you're going to keep living like you did before, we're going to have to rough time believing anything's happened to you. If you continue to live in the emptiness of your mind, the vanity of your mind, notice the description there. I read it to you a moment ago, but it's worthy of some attention because he said the understanding is darkened, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. One idea from that is, is moral blindness. So many people you see have a conscience that's dead, so therefore they're blind morally. They will give the right of way to everything that goes on. No wonder there's people in our society so ready to kill a, a full-term baby at nine months, ready to abort the baby. Uh, and I do believe that they ought to overturn abortion and all those things. Obviously, there's some political things that should have never been voted on to start with. But I mean, no, brethren, we ought to be concerned about the hearts of people that will allow them to believe that you can just do anything you want to with a human life and it's all right. It shows how far people's conscience is from God. After saying some of these things, Paul the Apostle says in verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. He said, this is not the teaching of the church. This is not the teaching that you've received through Jesus Christ, that you can just live any way you want to, live as if there is no God, live as if there is no hell, live as if there is no heaven. Hello. 
And so we're calling on believers to wake up. Somebody said, well, our nation really needs revival. I'm here to tell you the church needs it first. Yes. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yes. Judgment's going to begin at the house of God. It's not going to end at the house of God, but it's going to begin at the house of God. It's the house of God where we need some revival and renewal, where we need a, a real turnaround, where people need to see uh, the need to serve God in the beauty of holiness. People have trampled this thing under their feet somewhat. And brethren, now I'm calling on you today to answer the call. My message is the call to a life of contrast, to live a life very different from the world. That is a biblical call. Yes. First Peter 2, 9, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How many can lift your hand this morning and say, I'm answering the call. Yes, I'm not going to allow darkness to overwhelm my life. I refuse to go along with the world. If a million people are going in the wrong direction, it's still the wrong direction. Amen. The Bible says, thou shalt not follow a multitude. <laughs> can you say amen? And I'm all right with that. I don't want to follow a multitude. There's a multitude of people that are doing things just because of the finances. A lot of times, a lot of these companies, they're going a certain way just because they don't want to do anything that would hinder their bottom line. And they've caved in because they think it's going to make all the difference. And some political groups, they've caved in because uh, they don't want to lose any vote. It don't matter how it goes, they want to make sure. I'm here to tell you, we're going to stand before a holy God. Can you say amen? Yes. We're going to stand before a great God that sits upon the throne. Yes. Uh, brethren, I tell you, I'm going to pray to him now, so I won't be praying to the rocks later on. That's right. And the ones that don't pray to God now, they're going to be praying to the rocks, and rocks fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. Isn't that right? I tell you what, it's time for people to call upon God. We want to encourage people to, live, to leave a life of selfishness, to get away from that selfish, self-centered experience, uh, and to identify themselves with, totally with Jesus Christ. Yes. Paul the Apostle, in his writings, he pretty much said, either you are in Adam or you are in Jesus. Either you're fully identified with Jesus or you're identified with Adam. Adam is the one who failed. He's the one who bowed his knee and allowed Satan to become the illegitimate stepfather of mankind. Oh, uh, He's the one that selfishness, self-centeredness reached out and sinned and did those things. But thank God there is the last Adam. Somebody said, is he the second Adam? No, the Bible says Jesus is the last Adam. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, either you're going to identify with Adam in the garden who failed and bowed his knee, or you're going to identify with Jesus who was in the garden, and when the time came, he said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. We preached about it here on Wednesday night, how that the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. chose the Father's will. You can make a comparison. We did it Wednesday night between Satan and Jesus, that Satan wanted to ascend above the stars of God. He wanted to sit upon the throne of God, but when the time came, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Whenever he was in the garden, humbled himself and said, Father, I'll do whatever you have me to do. He asked that if the cup could be passed from, uh, could pass from him, but to how many old brethren, when he couldn't pass from him, he drank the bitter cup. Can you say amen? We used to sing that old song. He drank the bitter cup, even though he could have called 10,000 angels to say, pull the nails from my hands that torment me. Yes, amen. Had it not been, Glory to God for the Lord Jesus Christ, for a place called Mount Calvary, for an old rugged cross. Can you say amen? Had it not been for Jesus, the last Adam, can you say amen? amen. That's who I'm identified with this morning. I'm calling out the name of Jesus. I'm worshiping him and following him. Oh, Somebody yeah. said, Brother Bobby, we can see flaws in your life. There's no doubt in my mind that you can see that I'm flawed and I'm human like everybody else. But also you can tell I'm going in the opposite direction of this world. Can you say amen? amen. Now this world's going one way and I'm going the other way. Can you say amen? Right. It's a 180 degree difference. Can you say amen? Right. It's contrast. There's no comparison. I'm headed toward heaven. This world is trying its best to plumb the depths of hell. What we want to do is uh, plunder hell to populate heaven while well, we've got opportunity. Can you say amen? It's time for believers to rise up once again and say, look here, we're going to go in a different direction. Yes. And we're going to give pastors and leaders of our churches the authority back to be able to speak into our lives and bring accountability. And when people are living lifestyles of sinfulness and claiming to be a Christian, uh, they're going to need to be dealt with and confronted. That's right. Because you're diminishing the testimony of the church overall. You're making the church look worse than the world. Oh my. We expect the world to be the world. Yes. 
But we don't expect the church to do worse than the world. When Paul wrote the church at Corinth, he said, you got things going on in that church that's not even going on in the world. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Hello. <laughs> that's why it's a tremendous time of a call to repentance. And of course, uh, and thinking of it along the lines with fathers, of course. Uh, and we fathers, we dread Father's Day because they'll be good to mothers on Mother's Day. On Father's Day, they just ream us out and skin us like a mule. <laughs> Time we leave the service, we're fried, dried, and laid aside. <laughs> Isn't that right? Of all the things, of course, we know we're the head of the home, so the intensity is going to be with the fathers because the rise and fall of the fathers is going to be the rise and fall of the church and the nation. So goes the church, so goes the nation. So goes fathers, that's how the home is going to go. Mothers have such an important role, what have you, but they're not the head of the family. Most of, many times they have to be, by default, <laughs> which is kind of pitiful. Mm -hmm. Can you say amen? amen? I thank God for the godly fathers and those who've stayed yes. on with the things of God. Yes. Whenever people come alive in the new birth, I mean, it changes everything about your life if you will allow it to. Amen. Now, I've certainly made mistakes and things. It, you know, anybody gets it, and I've been around a couple of preachers to hear them tell it, they've never made a mistake. Uh -huh. One preacher told me, one preacher told me to my face that he didn't make no mistakes. Uh -huh. Oh, and I was thinking, you're making a mistake while you're telling me you're not making a mistake. <laughs> I'll tell you what, to, uh, you know, it's one thing uh, to make a mistake, do something wrong, but then have no heart or no conscience at all about what you did, that you're just soulless and disconnected from the inner man, disconnected from your conscience. I tell you, I can work with anybody as long as they got a conscience and they realize that they've missed it. But now in America, we got many fathers that are just living like brute beasts. That everything is there just for them. They're totally selfish and self-centered and disconnected from the damage they're doing to their families and to their communities. Many are perpetrating crimes upon their own families. These fathers that are so horribly bound with all types of addictions or whatever you are perpetrating crimes upon their own families. Living lives of immense darkness, we, darkness, we would call it soulless. It's not that they don't have a soul, but they're totally disconnected from it. And are unaware and carrying on things like that. That's why it's so glorious whenever these uh, men get born again. How I many brethren, it's not just a matter of fatherhood. It starts, first of all, with being a man. We need such improvement along the lines of manhood in America. It was something we were so conscious of coming out of the 20th century. But now in America, there's a real crisis of manhood. It's from the men is where you get the fathers, contrary to what they're trying to tell us right now across America. But uh, you know, a lot of folks are getting confused completely about gender and all that. And we don't mean to be mean to anybody, but I'm here to tell you, when people get away from God, that's why all this gender confusion comes in. When the nations rebel against the Lord, then they don't, they can't really tell what's going on. Then. And there are people with college educations got more letters after their name than anybody you've ever seen that said on television this week that they couldn't tell you what a, what a woman was. No. Not only that, they asked them, can a man get pregnant? They said, absolutely. <laughs> Crazy. And I hate to be ugly, and it's not funny, but really, you know, it would be funny if it wasn't so pathetic, but, it, you know, and you can't hardly help but laugh a little bit because we were all raised, you know, at a time, I mean, the majority of us was raised at a time where we didn't, you know, like, what? <laughs> you know, but yet we realize this confusion is very real, and it's where people want to accommodate everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, if you live after the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to accommodate everything. So I said, well, what about the love of God? It would be more loving for people to receive the truth than it would be for us just to accommodate every kind of peculiar Amen. idea, Amen. every strange thing. Amen. It was only just a few years ago, the first time I ever heard this statement, they said, well, this is my truth. We're living in a time now where people are living and doing what's right in their own eyes. they got their own truth mm -hmm. and their own things in all these different areas. How many know that is not how it works? Amen. 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 One fellow said everybody can have their own opinion, but not everybody gets their own facts. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Hello. Amen. I thought that's one of the best statements I've heard in a long time. You can have your own opinion, but you don't get your own facts. Uh-huh. Hello. Oh, yeah. I tell you what, we're taking our leading from the Lord Jesus Christ. We're walking 
according to the word of God, the Bible teaches what the apostle said, don't walk as the other Gentiles walk. Why? Because you have not so learned Christ. And then he said, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Why didn't Paul say, if you heard me, if you heard my teaching, he actually did a little bit of that in Ephesians 3, but here in Ephesians 4, he said, you've heard Jesus. I mean, when Paul dies, Jesus is still leading his church. Amen. Then they write, if Paul Amen. is martyred on the, on the Austrian way, I mean, oh, Jesus Christ is still ahead of the church. Right. I'm here just as an under-shepherd. Something's going to happen to me. Eventually it happens to every other preacher. But I mean, oh, brethren, the church of Jesus Christ marches on. And your relationship is with Jesus. How are you learning from Jesus? Certainly you're not learning uh, that uh, you should just walk and live like a Gentile. Hello. <laughs> he said, you have not so learned Christ. If you've been taught by him, if you've heard the truth, God gives us gifts, pastors and teachers. That's at the beginning of this chapter. Once he told them about the glorious gifts God had given them, grace gifts given to the church, so that these... Uh, Christians could fulfill the ministry and see the church grow and be unified. Then he said to them, I insist now that you walk differently than the Gentiles. I mean, if Paul the Apostle urged them, if he was insistent about it, if he said to them with such uh, you know, authority that he said, I testify in the Lord. I mean, oh, he's been as strong with them as he could be just about. <laughs> he did everything but swear. Hello. <laughs> Then over into the fifth chapter, he says, be not ye therefore partakers with them. He's talking about those committing fornication and all that. Remember the preceding verses, he says, those in covetousness and fornication. Mm -hmm. He put covetousness and fornication on the same plane. Oh Here we talked about greediness from Ephesians chapter 4. He said, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. He said, there is a marvel contrast that has come into your life. You used to be darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Can you say amen? Yeah, yeah. We're talking about living a life of tremendous contrast. Uh -huh. What people are telling me is now that once you get born again, you can't tell one bit of difference between a Christian and a sinner. Uh, the, the Christian actually may be stumbling more than the sinner is, and he's about to stumble his way every bit of the way, all the way uh, to the gates wow. of heaven. When I was growing up in the Baptist church, we used to sing a song that said, one of these days we're going to come sweeping through the gates. Just a little while to stay here. Just a little while to wait. And then one of these days we're going to come sweeping through the gates. Can you say amen? I mean, when you hear Christian people talk today, there ain't many of them sweeping anything. There ain't many of them coming in with any kind of victorious march or anything like that. It's like, we're going to go stumbling in one of the saints. Go drag him in. <laughs> Hello, one of the saints, go drag him in. Uh -oh. Drunk on Saturday night, in church on Sunday morning, maybe we'll get to heaven, maybe we won't. We don't know how it's going to be. No way. So I said, don't you want to come on to church? Sure we want to come on to church. But I don't know, we want people to know there's a victory in Christ Jesus. Amen. There's a life of holiness. Doesn't mean you won't ever miss it. God made provision for that. That if you're honest as you go forth and you uh, fall into something, if something happens, you're overtaken in a fall. The Bible says you can be restored. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, no oh, brethren, to teach people that they're just going to stumble every step of the way between here and eternity, that is not a biblical teaching. Amen. We need to get delivered from it. Can you say amen? Because amen. people are perfecting this uh, uh, type of teaching where you stumble every step of the way because a lot of them are stumbling every step of the way. When you look on their lives, you'd have to wonder if they've ever been born again. That's you'd have to wonder if they've ever committed themselves to Christ or not. Amen. And as I said to you, most of our church services just wound up being a, a seminar on how to be a better you. Uh, I mean, we need an old-fashioned, heaven-born Mount Sandy I gully worship. Amen. Where you get delivered from you, and you get delivered from the devil, you get delivered from the world, and you get delivered from the flesh. Amen. Amen. Hello. <laughs> we need to have some old fashioned uh, coming to Jesus type of services where people get back to know and look here. God never intended for you to live in this world and see how close you could live to the world and still make heaven your home. 
But he puts you in this world to see how much distance you can put between you and the world as you go ahead toward heaven to see how much distance you can put between this godless, rebellious Amen. society that shakes its fist in the face of God. And while they're shaking their fist in the face of God, I'm going to raise my hand and give him the glory. He is the worthy one with the high praises of God in my mouth and a two-edged sword in my hand. I'm going forth with the word of God. Every step I take, it's God walking in me. Every move I make, it's Christ in me. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. I ain't got no business of, of causing any other thing in my life to be married up with this world. Yes. I should not be united with this world at all because I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah. That's right. It shouldn't have any place in me. He said, don't give the devil any place in this chapter that we just read, Ephesians 4. He said, don't give the devil any place. Oh, I don't know how we lost our victory along the way, but we did. Thank God God will give it back to us. But I've never heard so much moaning and groaning and carrying on in Christian people that you hear today that according to them, there's just no hope for any kind of victory between here and the time we get to heaven. Help us, Lord. I tell you, just a few years ago in our churches, uh, we were had a different spirit and a different attitude about that. Right. <laughs> That's right. We used to sing the victory. I tell you what, we'd pull out them handkerchiefs and sing power in the blood and wave those handkerchiefs for the Lord. The power of God would fall on us in such a way that, uh, that uh, you know, some heavenly somebody just took over that whole service and we'd blink our eyes and sinners would be in the altar and repenting and they would pray, they would cry, pull the tears that big around. Uh, I preached out there in uh, Arizona at the uh, the Pima Indian Reservation. And when I preached that afternoon, they start their show a little later anyway, uh, but they had a lunch every, every Sunday afternoon. And they, they turned over to me about 11 or so. I started preaching about 11.45, I guess. We sung and all that. Uh, preliminaries, and, and actually it was probably uh, 11.45 or so before I actually started preaching. But I preached about 30, 35 minutes. And uh, to God be the glory, the power of God fell in there. And I'm telling you, we stayed there in the altar to after 2 o'clock, maybe about 2.30 before we went back and had the lunch. And I went around and looked, and there was pools of tears in the carpet all around up front. People backsliders got back to God. Lives got changed. People became uh, delivered from whatever it was that they were in. I mean, we need an old-fashioned, old-time, Holy Ghost move of God. Can you say amen? Somebody said, I don't know if that fits in with my denominational upbringing. Honey, I'm here to tell you, God's going to overturn your denominational stuff in you. If your denominational stuff stands between you and God, it's time for you to kick over that sacred cap. It's the truth. And say, hey, let's get delivered from all of this religion. Let's start getting people delivered uh, from drugs and alcohol. Let's let them get delivered from all the other addictions and things. I don't even like listing it anymore. I don't want to give any, the devil any free air time. <laughs> I don't even like giving the list anymore about all the things that people, because there's no way that you can really list it. But the shame is, is that people are still sitting inside the prison cell when the door has been ripped plumb off the hinges. Oh Here Jesus has come to the prison house of sin, took the door, ripped it plumb off, hinges and all, flung it away, and then people are still sitting in there uh -oh. and won't come out of the jail cell. Uh -oh. Isn't that the shame? Isn't that the disgrace? Uh -huh. You look in there, you know, they got their baptismal certificate hanging up on the wall. Uh -uh. <laughs> you look in there and they got home sweet home written inside the prison cell. Got a home sweet home. You think, hey, <laughs> you want to live in the prison after the door has been tore off the hinges? What in the world is going on? Right. In many ways, that's what Paul said to the church of Ephesus. Why do you still want to live this way when you've been set free? When you have all the blessings that are in Christ Jesus, you've been adopted, you've been redeemed, you've been forgiven. He just oh, made one yeah. list after another. The longest sentence in the Bible is in Ephesians chapter 1 as Paul gives one blessing after another, one marvelous facet of grace after another, what God's done for us. And then tells us about Jesus sitting far above all principality, power, and might. And then he says to them, why do you still want to stay in the prison house when you could come out. Can you say amen? amen. I don't understand it. Can you say amen? amen? If I was in a jailhouse last night and if they left the door open, they don't want to worry about serving me breakfast. Can you say amen? I'll get my breakfast somewhere else. <laughs> Everybody I've ever talked to about jail said it was the worst thing you'd ever run into. They would never go back again. Spent one night, and he said, I'll do everything in my power never to go back. He said, he'll never get me inside one of those places again. 
I wonder why folks don't get fired up, get mad at the devil a little bit, and not want to go into these uh, situations where they, they are bound and where they're or their lives are being so ruined and whatever. Why don't people just sit by and let the devil just do anything he wants to do to them? The door's been ripped off. Get up out of there and come on out. Amen. Somebody said, well, you know, when it comes to salvation, there's nothing you can do. Honey, there's a few things you better do. If you don't, you're going to stay in the prison house. <laughs> you better work out your own salvation. You better put on the new man. Can you say amen? <laughs> He says here, put on the new man. Put off the old man and put on the new man. There is a few things you can do. You're not saved by your works. The quality of your works are not great enough to save you, but there's some things that God's called on you to do. He's called for you to live a life of contrast. Can you say amen? amen. Yes. I come across this story by the 19th century Russian Orthodox priest back in the 1800s. There was a time when the alcohol abuse in Russia was so bad that none of the priests even ventured out of the churches to help the people hardly. They waited for people to come to them. Uh, but the fellow by the name of John Kronstadt, uh, John Kronstadt said, hey, I'm not waiting for people to come to me, I'm going to go to them. And he was so compelled by love that he went out into the streets and he would find people that were hung over and they were lying in the gutter in the streets and in the ditches, foul-smelling people with that alcohol had just taken them over, it seemed like. And he'd pick them up in his arms and cradle them and say, this is beneath your dignity. You, weren't, you were meant to house the fullness of God. That was one of his favorite sins, to say, you were meant to house the fullness of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't that make you happy? <laughs> And then he just couldn't stand it. He had to go out there and let them know that this was beneath their dignity. We want people to know in America that a lot of what's going on right now in America is beneath your dignity. Oh, yes. You're worth more than that. God has put such a value on your life that it's time for God to deliver you. It's time for you to receive deliverance. Can you say amen? Amen. And the only way we can do that, of course, is calling upon the Lord and receiving him. Yes. I tell you, I've never met anybody that was sorry for coming to God, receiving Christ. Amen. Billy Graham says, back in the days when he was preaching here on the earth and, and blessed of God to do all the ministry that he did, he said he had never found an account anywhere where somebody who was born again and then was on the sick bed that became their deathbed, he said he never found an account of anybody who had ever uh, walked away from the Christian faith. Nobody that ever denied the Christian faith as they were coming down to death, that every one of them was glad that they know Jesus Christ as their soul. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Never been an account of them recanting their faith on the sick bed. <coughs> Hello? Right. Brethren, there's just some things you're never going to be sorry for. Amen. Amen. You'll never be sorry for walking after the Lord Jesus amen. Christ, turning your back on this world, and living a life of contrast. Can you say amen? Amen. Let's stand our feet today and honor the Lord and bless his name. And let's respond to the Holy Spirit right at this moment as we concentrate on the work of the Spirit in our lives. We believe God's given us a thought from the scriptures this morning that can bear much fruit in our lives. And, and we see the fruit of good teaching among the brethren at Ephesus that once they had come to Christ, they began to put on the new man. They were certainly encouraged greatly to do so by Paul the Apostle. His heads are bowed today, brethren. It may be that someone would just need to use the altar. It may be that you need to receive ministry. Whatever that uh, the need is today, we just welcome you to come and invite you to receive from the Lord. You certainly can do so in your own time and, and uh, in your own home and your own devotional times or whatever it may be. Right here as we come together as the family of God, in the love of God, we reach out to you. And we expect the wonderful moving of the Holy Spirit. And we believe that God can meet needs this morning. The heads are bowed just for a few moments. We are reverencing the Holy Spirit right where you are. Just receive from God. We believe that the Lord is going to do the wonderful, wonderful work. Father God, we just reverence the Holy Spirit now. We just ask that. The Spirit of God will work in the lives of all of us, God, that we would be drawn closer as a result of this service today. That, God, we would fan the flames of revival in our midst. Lord, we believe you're doing something here, Wayshaq, and that you're blessing and encouraging and strengthening. 
And Father God, we ask that yes. you take place in such a beautiful, amazing way right here and right now. In Jesus' wonderful name. Hallelujah.